Hello, my name is Jonathan Hammond, and welcome to So Say We All's uh, 2021 February Vamp Dirty Talk Super Spreader. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Insert coronavirus joke, probably. <laughs> um, tonight is the one year anniversary since So Say We All has gone digital due to coronavirus. So, so Say We All is a literary and performing arts nonprofit. Our mission is to create opportunities for people to tell their stories and tell them better. We achieve this through three core priorities publishing, performance, and education. Uh, this is my sixth year before, uh, producing the uh, Dirty Talk. And that's deeply ironic because I am a pilgrim. Um, <laughs> tonight's stories uh, are going to be stories that are, are either um, sex positive in nature, risque, or going to be about something that has to do with a super spreader or with uh, coronavirus. And now, first up, vamp veteran, Miss Vicky Chavez. my second year in grad school, I decided to find a temporary job. I landed at Hot Topic in my first ever real, real retail experience. It wasn't exactly Hot Topic, but rather the new sister store, aka the store that catered to fat alternative and goth chicks. And that's who they were looking to hire. I just so happened to be a fat goth chick. It was an awesome place to work because I was surrounded by gorgeous fat girls with thick thighs, juicy, fat asses, and long, colorful hair. There was one significant physical feature that I didn't have, which made me stand out amongst my coworkers. I didn't have that one thing that is so beloved on fat goth girls, big old titties. I've barely been a B cup since junior high, a status I am grateful for, especially as I've gotten older. But on that sales floor, I was the only one not to have giant knockers. And it was remarked upon with some regularity. I didn't fit into that classic fat goth girl fetish. And quite honestly, compared to the lovelies that I worked with, I felt anything but feminine compared to them. One day while straightening up the store, I noticed two guys following me around. They looked to be in their late 20s, early 30s, one dressed in an ill-fitting sport jacket, open shirt, no tie, and loose-fit dress pants. The other wore a polo shirt and jeans. Neither fit into the store's typical customer base, and thus they stood out. They weren't scary or really creepy, but it was clear that they were focused on me and not interested in any of the other girls. I approached cautiously and asked him if I could help him. They replied, yeah, we're here to see you and make you an offer. We want to make a movie with you. I was shocked that I was being propositioned. I mean, of all the girls in the store, why was I the one they approached? Why me? My curiosity outweighed my caution. They introduced themselves as a director and producer who made specialized videos. They were so courteous and well-spoken and straightforward but I stood too stunned to say anything. They explained that they had noticed that I had lovely feet and I would be a perfect fit for their next project. I looked down and saw that I was wearing my usual Converse and was puzzled as to how they could know what my feet looked like. The producer explained that they'd been in the store a few days earlier and saw me wearing sandals. He went on to describe the sandals I was wearing along with the color of my nail polish the curve of my arch, the shape of my toes, with detailed accuracy. It was clear that he'd studied my feet and committed them to memory. I was so confused. My feet, my feet. Why would they want my feet in a movie? The producer went on to explain that for a certain audience, feet were a huge turn-on, and that my feet were exceptionally gifted. He stated that my feet were destined to be stars amongst foot aficionados. The high arch, the gentle curve, they were particularly lovely and were in high demand amongst fetishists. 
I couldn't believe that he was talking about my feet with such appreciation and longing in his voice. My feet, I'd never considered my feet to any extent, other than they were a bit large and otherwise unremarkable. I finally asked the question, which I was not sure I wanted to know the answer to. What would I have to do? The director took over at this point, and he described a variety of scenarios. Okay, a kiddie pool filled with jello. You stomp around and squish it between your toes. We'd focus the camera directly on your feet so you would remain virtually anonymous. Or we fill it with pudding, if that would be more to your liking. Butterscotch works particularly well on film, he explained. Or we could fill it with peas. You'd smash the peas with your toes and we would do close-ups of you squeezing them. And for each shot, we change the color of your nail polish. Perhaps have you try on a few different pairs of shoes and take stills of those to insert like between the scenes. Okay, so far not so bad, I thought. He went on to describe another scenario wherein I would have whipped cream spread on my feet and then someone would lick them clean. Huh, another person would be involved? That's verging on prostitution, I thought to myself. I asked, why would I do this? What would be the benefit for me? We will pay you $2,000 for about four hours worth of work. $2,000 for videos of my, my feet. <laughs> I instantly went through a million scenarios in my head, all of which somehow came back to you know haunt me. My grandmother would find out what I'd done. Now, how my grandmother would ever find out that I appeared in a foot fetish video didn't cross my mind. Just that somehow, some way, she would find out and I'd forever be known as the puta de pies in my family. <laughs> the other factor was that I was in grad school for women's studies. How could I, a burgeoning feminist scholar, allow myself to be objectified in such a way? and still hold my head up. If I contributed to the objectification of women in such a manner, what did that say about me and my moral convictions? I was still rather naive at that point in my sexual development. And while I didn't necessarily judge others for their sexual behaviors, I slut shamed myself something fierce and didn't push those sexual boundaries when it came to my own interest. After consider, consider, careful consideration, all within the span of about a minute, I turned them down flat, and they were quite disappointed. The producer pleaded with me to reconsider, as I had a true gift and one that could make me some quick, fast money. He offered, what if we got rid of the food part and just had you, oh, kicking a guy in the balls? As a feminist, <laughs> that should appeal to you. It was at that suggestion that I told them they had to leave. I mean, I love men. And I appreciate a good set of balls. I could never bring myself to hurt a pair. Of course, once they left the store, I immediately regretted turning them down. I mean, I considered how many books and tuition $2,000 would have covered. The next fall, when I returned to school, I began to take an interest in feminist perspectives on fetish and erotica. I found out that pedophilia is the most common fetish of a non-genital body part. I came to understand how the historic act of foot binding in China was tied to the sexual aspects of a curved foot culminating in the much sought after golden lotus. I read everything I could on the cinematic history of nods to the love and adoration of feet, most notably in the works of Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> I have thought about that offer to appear in a fetish film from time to time, and ultimately, I'm glad I didn't take him up on it. If I was willing to do that for $2,000, what other things might I have considered doing for money? The path such a decision would have taken would not have ended in a good place. The best thing to have come of the whole experience was a newfound appreciation of my feet. I have come to value their beauty and their allure, and I take really good care of my feet pedicures, massages, special creams and socks, all in an attempt to pamper my most precious physical gift. I dated a guy who revealed after our first sexual encounter that he had a foot fetish, and yes, my feet were extraordinary. While sex play with my feet did nothing for me, it was nice to appreciate a part of my body as being able to give pleasure that I had not before considered. 
my feet, yes, my feet are objects of desire and beauty. And I have come to embrace such a bold proclamation. Such realization has led me to feel beautiful and lovely in ways I'd never considered before. Even on those days when I feel ugly and unattractive, I can gaze down upon my feet and I am reminded I have something special. So yes, while the girls I worked with at Torrid had some lovely, big, huge knockers, those soft mounds that many a fantasy are based upon, I have my own lovely gift of physical perfection and beauty. My feet, my gorgeous lovely feet that are worthy of adoration and worship. Who needs the hassle of big chichis when you can have the stuff of every Potiphar's fantasy? Yay! Please consider donating or becoming a member. More information at so say we all online. <clears throat> we were still a few hours from our destination, along a long stretch of desert highway, when my father turned to me and asked, So, uh, what's the big deal with, uh, butt stuff? I tried not to react to the question, although I do remember swerving the car a bit. How, how did we get to this point in our once icy father-son relationship, I thought. But I knew damn well it was no one's fault but mine. To hear my father tell it, I had always been a weird kid. When I was six, he'd coached my t-ball team. Years later, while I fondly reminisced over an old team picture, my father surprised me by describing it as the most disappointing moment of my life. <laughs> while I'd never been much of an athlete, I hadn't realized that the entirety of my father's aspirations for me hung solely on my success as a professional t-ball player. In my defense, we didn't live in the best of neighborhoods, and as a result, I wasn't allowed to associate with the kids outside. While other children my age had parks, sports, and socializing, I had books, movies, and a TV set that seemed to be constantly on at my house. I remember how excited I was the day my father gave me my own little TV set, which, to my mother's dismay, well, he'd tell her, nah, I was raised on TV, look how I turned out. In fact, that man consumed about five or six hours of television a day which, for me, seemed like a normal pastime if you were forced to stay inside. It wasn't until years later that it would dawn on me that it was also around this time that my father seemed to lose interest in me as a person. But at the time, not knowing any better, I was happy to retreat into TV land and, as such, proceeded to become the very antithesis of the athlete my father had once hoped for. I became an indoor kid. <laughs> in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the term nerd was one of derision. This was decades before it would become the badge of honor it's considered today. Personally, I preferred the term arts enthusiast. That was my badge of honor, and I wore it proudly. I could hardly consume enough media, and when I wasn't taking it in, I set out to create some myself. It was to my father's credit that, in a household where I was hardly allowed to touch the microwave for fear of its imminent destruction, he eventually relented and allowed me to use the video camera in order to make movies and the stereo in order to record audio plays. Although, what I initially ascribed to my father's uncharacteristic generosity later turned out to be something else entirely. According to him, you were such a pain in the ass. Letting you use the camera was the only thing that kept you from bouncing off the goddamn walls. Whatever the reason, I quickly set out to create. And I never really stopped. Of course, there were Attempts at real careers, prompted by my father's urgings to get a goddamn job. In fairness, I had a lot of goddamn jobs, most of which I was pretty goddamn good at. But ultimately, nothing satisfied me like pursuing artistic ventures. Naturally, there would be, there'd be a myriad of false starts, dead ends, and outright failures. But any true artist will tell you that it's all part of the process. At least, that's what we often tell ourselves. But to my father, they all seem like signs that I should straighten up, fly right, and pursue a more stable path. Well, after a decade of failing to straighten up, however, <clears throat> it must have eventually become clear to him that I was thoroughly dedicated to failing at the arts, and he eventually stopped trying to change my mind. Over the last two decades, I've been involved in a myriad of projects, including a number of films and digital series for 
both myself and various media organizations. After a while, my father stopped complaining, even congratulating me from time to time. But I always knew that nothing I created was ever his cup of tea. That was until my podcast. In the late 2010s, in the wake of yet another breakup, a friend and I decided to start a relationship podcast. Certainly not to offer dating advice, as we were both just as jaded and cynical regarding modern romance, but rather as a way to publicly bitch and complain about the string of exes whose specter we both carried around like a steamer trunk of emotional baggage. Certain that no one would want to hear about the love life of two failures, we centered the podcast around the sordid, tumultuous tales of the world's most high-profile couples. It would be an affirmation to lonely hearts everywhere that love was a lie, and that even the most rich and beautiful weren't immune to heartbreak. We'd call it, You're Gonna Die Alone. Slowly but surely, the podcast began to gain traction. At first with our friends, who admitted they'd only listen out of a sense of obligation, <laughs> but later began actively recommending the show to others. And later with actual strangers, who began sending us messages asking that we cover specific couples. To say the podcast was exploitative was an understatement. We'd cover fairly mainstream couples whose relationships the general public widely heard of, but in an attempt to add something new, or maybe fear of being considered boring, we'd discuss the sordid details as well. Desi Arnaz's insatiable appetite for prostitutes, the corruption of Bobby Brown by the not-so-innocent Whitney Houston, Eddie Murphy's alleged transgender fetish, Courtney Love's pregnant heroin use, Johnny Depp's severed finger, and, of course, the persistent rumors of Jackie Kennedy's affair with both Bobby and Ted. In an attempt to insulate ourselves from litigation, we backed up every rumor with up to 20 hours worth of research and were always careful to hide behind the media's magic word, the phrase that has saved or ruined many a career. Allegedly. <laughs> as revealing as we attempted to make the series, the most salacious details by far came from my co-host and I. As comfortable with our unseen audience, as the series continued, we steadily became comfortable with our unseen audience. Kristen and I would regularly relate tales not only of past relationships, but of past sexual exploits. We would often regale, or perhaps subject, the audience to stories of sexual discovery, including our earliest experiences with the act of physical love, all the way to experimental phases, such as my numerous failed attempts at successfully participating in a three-way. There were also numerous tales of sexual experimentation, including with the opposite sex. Again, in an effort to avoid seeming boring, we'd refer to sex as boinking, spelunking the mole hole, parting the pink sea, mounting the baloney pony, observing Taco Tuesday, or simply riding the beef bus into Tuna Town. We'd often refer to our respective body parts as sweater melons, meat wallets, spasm chasms, vulverines, clam hammers, yam bags, and ham candles. Euphemisms aside, I'm not quite sure what drove us to openly share the most intimate details of our personal lives with complete strangers. Things we'd never dream of openly sharing with those closest to us. But we did, and it somehow felt good to be so open about it. Particularly with people we'd never meet. Which is why I was so horrified the day my father asked to listen to my podcast. <laughs> Perhaps out of a sense of familial obligation, or maybe just boredom, I had agreed to take a week off and drive my father to Texas to visit an alien relative. In his later years, my father had developed a fear of flying, which was just another of the multitude of things we didn't have in common. Within the first, within the first few minutes of our two-hour drive, it became clear just how long the trip would be when we clashed over what to listen to. I preferred to not listen to his smooth jazz CDs, and my father refused to listen to my classic rock playlist, insisting that... I already listened to that shit in the 70s and 80s. Enough already. <laughs> Talking would, of course, be out of the question. We hadn't said much to each other over the past few decades, and it would somehow seem contrived and dishonest to start now. Well, he finally said to me, what about that radio program you do? It hadn't occurred to me to even suggest one of my podcasts, as he'd never much liked anything I produced. Then again, it would make sense that a man who'd spent the past... 70-some years of his life watching TV might actually be interested in the private lives of the celebrities he was so familiar with. So, at the next gas station, I downloaded a few episodes for him to choose from. To my surprise, he chose an episode on Khloe Kardashian and Lamar Odom, 
two figures I didn't realize my father even knew existed. And we proceeded to listen to the episode in silence. An hour later, as the episode ended, I was surprised to hear my father say, those Kardashian women, they, uh, uh, they ruin their men, don't they? Christ, I remember when Bruce Jenner was still a male. Upon expressing surprise at the astuteness of his comment, he assured me that he hardly misses an episode of what I was surprised to find out was one of his favorite shows. <laughs> the Daily Gossip Series, TMZ. But what he told me next surprised me even more. You and your co-host there, you've, uh, you got some good chemistry. That show of yours, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Before I had time to decide whether or not he was humoring me, he quelled all doubts when he said, Let's listen to another one. So we listened to another one. And another one after that. And with every episode, he silently took in not only the celebrity gossip, but also the personal stories. My personal stories. Those of my disastrous romantic history, dating habits and sexual exploits, my casual experimentation with members of the same sex, and instances of sexual adventurousness and discovery. Maybe it was the vulgar language we used to describe it all that made it somehow more digestible. He even chuckled a few times at the vulgarity, like when I informed my co-host that I had, quote, been, <clears throat> been tongue-jabbed in the shitbox this weekend. <laughs> but it was most likely my brutal openness on the podcast that eventually led to his brutal openness when, between episodes, my father turned to me and asked, So, uh, what's the deal with, um, butt stuff? It should be noted that while I was growing up, my father never once made a single effort to sit down and explain the birds and the bees. If he was somehow trying to make up for that now, I thought, this is a hell of a place to start. Well, I said, what do you want to know? Well, uh, what's the big whoop with all the kids licking each other's butts these days? Are people just gayer than they were before? I explained to my father that, from what I understood, the act commonly known as analingus was quickly becoming mainstream among people of all sexual preferences. The things that his generation might have stigmatized as taboo were just the norms of today. Give me a break! What, do you think your generation invented premarital sex? While I knew we hadn't, I admit that I'd never given much thought to the sex lives of past generations. We tried things. It's human nature. Hell, there was a period of time I only dated black women. For obvious reasons. Somehow, the statement managed to throw me off even more than my dad's butt stuff question. <laughs> Mainly because there was a period of time where I only dated black women as well. And my mind was suddenly flooded with thoughts of my father having the same tastes and preferences as me. He'd said he dated black women for obvious reasons. What were those reasons? Were they the same reasons I had for dating black women? Were his reasons somehow racist? Were my reasons somehow racist? Before I could obsess further, he once again interjected. Look, I, I don't mean gay isn't bad. I mean, gay isn't different. This too confused me. I immediately thought of the time back in my college years when I'd invited a group of guys over to my parents' house where I was still living to sit around, get drunk, and watch the 1980s comedic masterpiece Airplane. Halfway through, my father walked in took one look around the room and loudly asked, Hey, where the hell are all the ladies? What are you guys, gay? <laughs> the room grew silent as everyone awkwardly turned to our gay friend Fernando, who raised his hand and said, Actually, I am. My father pretended to cringe, almost in a mock conciliatory manner, then walked over to Fernando and jovially patted him on the back before bursting into laughter. Then, much to my relief, one by one, the rest of the guys burst into laughter, including Fernando, and we went back to watching Airplane and getting hammered. You know, Dad, I said finally, a lot of gay people and their sexual tastes are just as diverse as any other group. What, you think I don't know gays? I know gays. I, I grew up with gays. This was a surprise to me as well. Remember my cousin Gus? He's gay. Yeah, he, he was gay from day one. Hell, we must have all known he was gay before he even knew he was gay. When I asked how they all knew he was gay, my father was quiet for a moment, then chuckled to himself. We'd all go trick-or-treating together as kids, and uh, one year he insisted on going out as Carmen Miranda. <laughs> While I hadn't known my Uncle Gus was gay, rather than being shocked, I was 
too busy doing the math in my head. If there were kids when this occurred, then it must have been sometime in the early 1950s. The first question that came to my head was whether or not any of the other kids gave him a hard time. Of course not. Nobody gave Gus a hard time. Why's that, I asked him. Because the other kids knew we'd kick the shit out of them if they did. Somehow, this surprised me most of all. My father and I sat in silence for what seemed like an eternity. I couldn't imagine what he'd say next until he did. <laughs> Look, what a man does with his dick is none of my goddamn business. But the ass, I don't know, I just, I, I don't get it. Well, I said, I guess it's just not for you, Dad. I mean, even for me, it isn't a thing I do every day. But every now and then, in the heat of passion, I guess the mood just catches you. At this, he once, again, sat silent for a long while. We may have sat in silence for an hour or... Maybe it was just a few seconds, but it seemed like forever before he finally spoke. So, uh, what, uh, what does it taste like? I quickly gathered my thoughts before turning to him with a response. Honestly? Pennies. <laughs> At that, my father and I proceeded to share what may have been our first genuine laugh together. At least the first one I can remember. Well, he finally said, let's listen to another one. Thank you. That was Vamp First Timer, Jordan Jacobo. This happened two weeks ago, two weeks before tonight's Thursday show. It was midnight on the outskirts of Oklahoma City in the parking lot of a Circle K. It was well below freezing and an Arctic wind was blasting. I was ducked down beside my car, freezing my naked finger to the nozzle of the coin-operated air pump. The tire was hissing at me, so I hissed back at it. I needed to get it full enough to drive on for another 10 miles to get inside for the night without it blowing up in my face. My husband Daniel watched from a few feet away, shivering and stomping in the flannel hoodie that is one of our coziest when we're back home in San Diego. The dog watched through the window of the back seat on high alert, wondering what we got her into this time. This was the end of day one of our drive home from our COVID road trip to Florida and the Carolinas. We drove cross country instead of flying as part of our safety plan. And we stayed for a month because once we drove all that way, we wanted to see both of our parents who all live in the three neighboring states. You're wondering how much to disapprove of our trip. It was about 90% Fauci approved and about 10% fuck it. <laughs> we are gays who grew up in the, during AIDS in the 90s. We've been together since the late 90s. We know how to negotiate risk in personal relationships. In the pandemic, we get to do this with our parents and friends, too. <laughs> no, Mom, we will not stay in your house. No, we don't feel right visiting our dozens of other cousins and aunts and uncles who live in the area as much as we do love them. Our plan was to get tested as we went, which ended up being only once because appointments were scarce for some reason one year into the pandemic, and we didn't want to take tests away from locals who had more need for them. This whole trip was inspired by Daniel's grandfather, Walter, who's going on 97 and is down from New Jersey, staying in Florida, down the road from Daniel's father and stepmother for a couple months. Walter is in decline, we were told, cognitively and physically, since his wife, the absolute, absolute legend Jenny, died two years ago. He seemed okay to Daniel when they talked on the phone, but 97 is old, even in that family, and we did not want to delay a visit that could be our last and we wanted to see if he needed anything that we could help with. When we got to Florida, Walter was very happy to see us and clearly flattered that we came. He showed no signs of giving up the family's trademark hard-charging independence, making us wonder if the news of his decline had been premature. Walter and Daniel's father and his six siblings are a proud and combative crew of New Jersey Italians. The matriarch, Grandma Jenny, a few days before she died, 
demonstrated her vigor to the doctor with her famous high kick, which, since she was lying down in a hospital bed at the time, almost broke the doctor's face. <laughs> Ma, don't kill the doctor, yelled Aunt Joanne, starting a loud argument. You can't tell them anything, even something that feels like it should go without saying, like, don't kick the doctor. <laughs> you can't tell them anything, but every one of them will tell you everything. Daniel and I often say the unofficial family motto to each other. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> Sometimes we're joking. <laughs> Walter's caretaker, Anna, drove him from New Jersey to Florida in his own car, so now the challenge once he got there was to keep him from driving it. He's mostly blind, for one thing. In a stroke of Florida genius, Daniel's dad and stepmom got him a golf cart for his stay. We called it harm reduction. Walter treated that golf cart just like his car, taking miles-long rides up and down the coast. What? The battery's dead in my car. I had to go get a new battery for the car. He would cruise to the nearby surf shop and hang out with the owner. Daniel's just like his grandpa. He likes to drive. He likes control. Hands on the wheel. He did all the driving in our cross-country trip. Daniel is quick to act, quick to move on whether it's making plans for this road trip or planting his garden or buying new towels. He does the research, makes the decision, does the damn thing, and keeps moving. He has strong opinions. He wants everybody to have strong opinions. He is stunningly smart and has a strong sense of justice. He is a successful lawyer. <laughs> Me, I get stuff done, but in a slower and more circuitous way. I like the freedom of multiple options. I like to start something and see what happens. I drive a car when I need to because I got to go from one place to the other, but I don't care about driving. On this trip, Daniel doing all the driving freed me up to play DJ, navigate, and just enjoy the in-between of travel. The trip and family visits rolled on week after week. Every day we worked. Zoom, 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 <laughs> email, Zoom, Zoom, type, 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 Zoom. And then we'd have time in the, in the evening with the family and outdoor activities on the weekends. Our families were great hosts with care packages waiting in each town, creative meals, vain attempts to let us work un uninterrupted during the day. At the end of four weeks of these very full days, we were satisfied. We were also exhausted, homesick for our house and our bed and our favorite takeout from Little Lion in OB. We were desperate for quiet. We looked forward to starting the trip home with long stretches of road. We left Asheville, North Carolina, took a little lunch detour to Helen's Barbecue in Brownsville, Tennessee, which was delicious, even through chattering teeth as we sat out at her picnic table. Then Arkansas. We hit Oklahoma that first day of driving at about 9 p.m. Among all the signs for Cherokee Nation and for Cherokee Nation casinos, we started to see abandoned tractor trailer trucks along the side of the interstate, all of them empty and lying on their side. Just like that dead armadillo we saw in Florida and all the possums in Tennessee. After the first three or four of these overturned big rigs, we got the willies. What was going on here? Were the drivers okay? How long had they been here? What kind of zombie hell was this? We realized with a jolt and a sinking feeling, ice on the road. Yep, there it was. An ice patch passed underneath the car. I clenched my butt and hovered over the seat in an instinctive and pointless separation from what was happening to the car. Daniel drove more and more slowly. To make this dicey situation worse, the state of Oklahoma this winter is rebuilding large sections of Interstate 40, which means that both sides of the highway were throttled to one lane each at about, in about 15 different sections for a couple of miles each. And then back again. So it was a bumpy, temporary asphalt slalom that crossed the median and put all traffic on one side and then back. They must have had 10 bridges under construction, back and forth, rocks and chunks of asphalt crunching and smacking against the car. But we made it. Daniel's skilled driving and eloquent cursing got us through. We were almost to Oklahoma City now, and the road opened up to four lanes. There were lights now, and there didn't seem to be any more icy patches. We started to breathe again. And then it happened. A truck in front of us swerved suddenly and shot something out behind it. It was several pieces, jagged metal and plastic garbage flying everywhere. The biggest pieces were as big as the truck's wheels. The truck had hit it and pieces were bouncing and breaking apart and flying through our headlight beams. 
maybe a, a, a big kitchen oven or a large microwave. Daniel jerked the car to the right, the safe lane, but a big piece of ragged junk flew there to meet us. We hit it. There was a loud grinding bump as we drove over it. Daniel kept control of the car. He slowed down and we kept moving. We took deep breaths and said fuck a lot. We comforted the dog who was in the back seat ready to fight or flee. Then the flat tire came on, flat, flat tire light came on, and we started cursing again and slowed down even more, and then we made it to the Circle K. The next morning, it's snowing in downtown Oklahoma City. The crippled car sits in the fire lane in front of the hotel, my little victory with the overnight desk guy when we dragged in at 1 a.m., I get up and shuffle around quietly. Daniel tossed and turned all night from the frustration of being trapped here and the upset at our car being damaged. I feed Trixie in the bathroom since she's a loud eater and look up flights home thinking about how Daniel is more desperate to get out of here than I am. How it's only fair that he fly home and I stay with the car since he drove this whole way and has more work stacked up than I do from balancing work and driving time and family time this whole trip. How maybe I could even relax during the delay and the hassle if it were just me, pretend to live in the Midwest. People in Oklahoma City in the eight or so hours we'd been here are all normal and helpful as we are the crazy panic people trying to get the hell out of here to get back to California. Trixie and I go downstairs for her walk. The frozen sidewalks do mean things to her feet, confusing us both. She holds up each paw in turn, looking to me for help. I pick her up and barely avoid slipping and body slamming us both. I find a frosty patch of grass for her to do her business. At 8 a.m. from the hotel, in the empty hotel lobby, I call the car dealership. A very friendly man named Jose says they are ready for us as soon as we can get there. He sounds cute. <laughs> I go back upstairs and Daniel is awake, eyes tired and sad, but also fired up, ready to murder this problem, full of ass kicking energy. I start to tell him my brilliant idea. What if you fly home? You're totally spent from driving and saving our lives last night. I already talked to the shop, but before I can say anything, he says, you should just go to the airport. I will deal with this. I laughed and then told him I had a flight all picked out, but it was for him and not for me. I said, let me do this, let me do this for you. He said, no, I'm not gonna be able to relax until this is over, and I would worry too much about you driving alone. So I flew home. I looked a real mess. I was serving what even is winter, don't get near me, realness? <laughs> Which is dirty jeans, three, letter, three layers of sweatshirts with a ragged knit beanie, two masks, and a face shield. I felt guilty abandoning ship, leaving Daniel and Trixie, but we were both relieved now that we didn't have to negotiate each other's stress or juggle our separate work calls inside the car once we got moving again. Splitting up made this particular crisis easier. On the way to the airport in my first ride share of the pandemic, I looked up the three-day forecast for Oklahoma City. I quote, total snow accumulations up to 10 inches. Travel could be very difficult to impossible. Areas of blowing snow could significantly reduce visibility and result in huge drifts of snow. The cold wind chills could cause frostbite on its exposed skin in as little as 15 minutes. So Daniel, baby, love of my life and my hardworking husband, if you see this, I hope you and Trixie are doing well in Oklahoma City. Stay safe. I can't wait to see you after the spring thaw. <laughs> that was Vamp veteran Hunter Gatewood. <laughs> I met him in 1997 in an AOL chat room. Are there any Latin lovers in here? I typed while giggling. His response, I'm Puerto Rican. That was it. That's all he said and we started chatting. This was back before cell phones and Wi-Fi. This was when I connected to the internet with an AOL CD and a landline, dialed me into this chat room almost every day for a year. His handle was Ruben A. Serrano. Mine was level 73. He was a virtual pen pal back then, and I wasn't even sure I was talking to a real person. But every day I'd go back for more. Eventually, our online chats had us deciding to take this relationship somewhere a little more intimate. The telephone. <laughs>
Long distance calls were not free back then, something I figured out when that last month's phone bill was over $400. Yet we continued to scramble to find a way to hear each other's voice. He was in Wisconsin and I was in San Diego and we were both enjoying this blooming potential romance with a virtual stranger. I would love to tell you that we had wild nights of phone sex and dirty, bad, nasty sex chats online, but we didn't. We did something I had never really done with a man. We got to know each other, like really know each other. Favorite song, favorite color, childhood traumas, future aspirations, past failures. We were completely open and for the first time in my life, I believed in soulmates. The calls turned into snail mail. We exchanged pictures and letters and gifts over the course of that year. My favorite gift was a copy of Hope for the Flowers. Hope for the Flowers is a book about two caterpillars who climb to the top of a caterpillar pile together to search for meaning, and they depend on each other to complete the journey. I felt like this was us. Every day we spoke for hours, trying to find meaning in our own lives and the world around us. He really listened to me, and I listened to him, and we tried to help each other figure it all out. Approaching his birthday, I told him he should come visit me. We were both cautious and thrilled at the prospect. This was not a time when you could swipe right and be at someone's house in an hour. This was an unknown world and a risk, but I was willing to take it. We were both about 23 years old, and our parents insisted that they have a conversation before he got on a plane to meet a stranger. They spoke, and I'm not sure how they convinced each other we weren't murderers, but they all agreed it would be okay for us to meet. I bought a black velvet form-fitting dress and these adorable Mary Jane heels. I dressed like I was going to meet the love of my life. It turns out I was. When I got to the airport, I parked. I walked in and located his terminal. I was a wreck, so nervous. I didn't know what to expect. This was before 9-11, so you could still walk directly to the terminal, and I anxiously did so. His plane landed, and I sat there waiting for what felt like forever. The entire plane emptied, and in the very moment I thought I'd been tricked, bamboozled, punked, he walked out. The most mischievous smile I've ever seen. I'll never forget it. Are you Carla? Yes. Did you think I didn't come? Yes. He hugged me and we laughed a lot. He was so cute. He was a good dresser and he smelled like fresh shaving cream. The minute I laid eyes on him, I was finished. He was the one. I knew it. What I didn't know then is that there are four types of multiple sclerosis. Relapsing, remitting, secondary progressive, primary progressive, and progressive relapsing. Primary progressive MS is the form that gradually gets worse over time. No relapses or remissions, just a slow or sometimes fast assault of the nervous system. Antonio from Wisconsin and I spent a week together and to date it is still one of the best weeks of my life. We did all the things. We went to the zoo, Disneyland, Coronado. We went salsa dancing at Cafe Sevilla and we made out a lot. I really did not know what to expect, but this was not a nightmare internet romance story. This was a best case scenario story. He was everything I wanted him to be, cute, funny, considerate, and damn, he smelled good. We did not have sex that week. At 23, I was still a virgin, and he was very careful with me, and we both agreed we would take it slow. We did practice a lot, though. <laughs> Knowing what I know now about sex as an older and more experienced woman, I am very impressed with the restraint we showed. Each day together was better than the last. I thought, is this what it's like to fall in love? Because this is awesome. Then something shifted. On our last day together, we began to get very grumpy. The affection was forced. The chatter was inconsequential. I had this sinking feeling in my gut. He was leaving. And instead of enjoying our last hours together, I let go sooner than I needed to because I was afraid that once he left, I might never see him again. When I dropped him off at the airport and we said, go and we said goodbye, he said, it's been real. And then he was gone. What the fuck? Yeah, it had been real. Real amazing. Real great. Real incredible. Real what? He left me there to fill in the blanks on my own. I didn't hear from him much after he left. One night, a few weeks later, he called and he told me that he loved me. But it was not a promise. It was like a dagger in my heart. 
How could such a connection fizzle out so easily? I created a boundary to protect myself. I would never be hurt like that again. I didn't hear from Antonio for a very long time. One day, 13 years later, I was at work and I received a message on Facebook from Ruben Serrano. Hi. I said hi back, not too sure if that was the best move, but also the truth was I had never stopped thinking about him. The connection between us fizzled, but it never died. We immediately began chatting regularly. There had always been an ease, a flow between us, and that had not gone away. So we began again. I learned that he had been at the same job for 10 years. He had never married or had kids, and neither had I. There were daily check-ins, phone calls, late nights on the phone, we would do ridiculous things like play songs for each other for hours, songs we had heard a thousand times. We read passages of poems to each other, and sometimes we would just sit silently on the phone listening to each other breathe. It sounds pretty creepy when I say it out loud, but at the time it made perfect sense. We quickly became very close once again. After a few of these catch-up sessions, he told me he'd recently been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. He told me a life-threatening illness had put some things in perspective for him. He made a mistake. I was the one who got away. Wait, what? I'm a Capricorn and very practical, and while that was exactly what I wanted to hear, I told him I was flattered, but we could not be more than friends. I didn't want to lose him again. The first time was enough. For a year, he pursued me, and we remained friends. I'd be lying if I denied having feelings for him, Plus, it was much easier to stay in contact with free long distance and instant messenger at my fingertips. He became my best friend, my confidant. I could and did tell him everything and no one made me laugh more than him. I asked him once if he had ever played cards against humanity and without missing a beat, he said, well, a few people, but not all of humanity. <laughs> that wit was something I could not get enough of. He confided in me too. He had lost most of his peripheral vision and had some shaking in his hands and legs, and he was tired a lot. His illness scared him. One night while we were talking, he told me he couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't be my friend because he loved me and he wanted more than friendship. And he hoped I felt the same way, but if I didn't, we'd have to go our separate ways because it was too difficult for him. I issued a challenge. I told him if he loved me, he should come and tell me to my face. And well, he did. He got on a plane with his parents and flew here to tell me that he loved me. He walked into the room, and while it was clear his physical body had been affected by the MS, it was also clear that my Antonio was still in there. He walked over to me and hugged me, and his parents said they would leave us alone to catch up. We were standing outside on the balcony of their hotel overlooking the marina. He took my face in his hands, and he kissed me the way women in movies are kissed. His hands were a little shaky from the MS, but it didn't stop him from kissing me, looking me right in the eye and saying, I love you. For the first time in my life, I believed that a man really, truly loved me, and I knew he meant it. Antonio and I were in a long-distance relationship for over six years. Not a day went by that we didn't speak. We traveled back and forth many times to see each other. These trips were always incredibly special and difficult. Long-distance relationships are never easy, and MS doesn't make anything easier. But we always made the effort to make every minute together count. He's the type of man that can make anything fun. We would watch Cheaters marathons for hours. I hated that show, but I loved watching it with him because we would just lay there and laugh at the stupidity of it all. The time we spent together was precious, and we made it work because we were in love. We made a lot of things work. I didn't know what to expect in the Department of Performance, but I'll have you know there were no issues there. When someone has a life-threatening illness, there are always complications when it comes to sex, but... When two people are in love, they find a way, and it becomes less of a hurdle than you might think. We knew what made each other happy, and we were happy for many years. We loved hard, and we talked about all the scenarios in which we could be together. Would I move to Wisconsin to be with him and leave my sick mother? What would his life be like if he packed up and moved here? So many scenarios, but we could never come to a conclusion or a compromise that resulted in us being together. One day, driving home from work, we were talking as he had done, as we had done every day, and I realized in that moment we would never be together in the way that you always imagine you will. I ended my love affair with Antonio in March of 2016 after I lost my mother in February. 
I had been a caretaker for her for almost 13 years. I knew what it entailed and I could not be what he needed me to be from such a distance. And he could not be what I needed him to be. Antonio is no longer able to speak very clearly. It has been almost a year since we had our last real conversation. Multiple sclerosis is a disease that attacks your nerve fibers and causes inflammation to spread in your body. It can affect your brain, your vision, your spinal cord, and your ability to do, all, to do things we all take for granted, like walking or talking or staying with the love of your life. Of the nearly one million people living in the U.S. with MS, no one ever thinks they will be one of those one million. When we first met, Antonio told me that he loved me, but that it wasn't a promise. And I was confounded that anyone could say that. I believe love is a promise. I love him and I will forever, but it's not a promise. I understand now. He is still one of my very best friends. His mom keeps me updated frequently and we still send messages and cards. I do imagine another life where we meet and we're both living in the same place and we are both healthy and we are together happily ever after. But that is someone else's love story. This is ours. That was Bant veteran, Ms. Carla Now. I'm a law abiding citizen. I pay my taxes and recycle, which is why I never imagined I would end up in the equivalent of a white collar prison, mandatory quarantine. A month before COVID broke out, I accepted a job at an international school in Thailand. Then when COVID hit, everything shut down. Businesses closed, flights stopped, and a national curfew went into effect. The good news is that after a few weeks, it worked. COVID was barely in existence. There were only a few cases and they were all foreigners entering the country with special permission. Back in the US, each day I received a new series of emails from HR with various hoops to jump through. It was as if I was viewed as the next typhoid Mary. But eventually, after a mountain of paperwork, I boarded an embassy repatriation flight. As I exited the plane in Bangkok, there were countless armed military men. They lined the walkway with their bodies arm to arm. I was shuttled into a holding area where my paperwork was triple checked and then escorted into a van to take me straight to my quarantine hotel. I arrived like a modern day leper with staff in hazmat suits, avoiding the slightest contact. And if you've never been in quarantine, you may think nothing happens. You sit in a hotel room for 15 days, but you would be wrong. Quarantine is like a condensed version of life. Time passes so slowly that each day is a new adventure of thoughts, emotions, and of course, stories. Day one and two slip by like a boozy long weekend, except instead of booze, it's jet lag that creates a time hangover. I wake up periodically and think, wait, where am I? Oh yeah, Thailand before I fall back asleep. Day three and four feel like a weekend. I nap, watch movies, talk on the phone. I think it's not that bad. Day five is when it hits. The vague sense of mental and physical exhaustion. I realize I've already watched everything and it's not even the halfway point. If you've ever seen that Salvador Dali painting with the melting clock, well, that's what it starts to feel like. I take a nap and realize only 20 minutes have passed. I write some emails, 15 more minutes. I also wake up in the middle of the night with diarrhea. I'm no stranger to traveler's diarrhea. I've had it on an overnight train in India and in the jungles of Costa Rica. But in all those other places, the saving grace was other people. Quarantine diarrhea is a new level. Completely isolated for days, my mind does the only thing it can. Spiral into a telenovela level of catastrophic thinking. Maybe I would trip in the middle of the night on the way to the bathroom, 
hit my head and lay there for days before anyone noticed I wasn't eating the meals left outside my door. Then I would spend months in a coma and only come out of it by giving birth to a baby I didn't know I was carrying. Day six. It's the first day I'm allowed outside for two hours. I get dressed and feel all nervous and giddy. Put on my hat, sunblock, and my shoes for the first time in a while. Then I sit on the couch and wait for an hour and a half. I get picked up by my hotel escort and the elevator door opens and I walk into the blinding sunlight and spot a small pool. The pool is small with some walkways around it, a stream of people who walk laps around it. And with no gym access, people patch together workout routines by walking laps and running. Day seven, I have run out of deodorant and it's 91 degrees. Definitely thought I packed more than I did. As I walk the pool laps, I'm grateful for the six feet apart rule. Day eight, with no deodorant and the high heat, I develop a new strategy. I wake up at 5.30 a.m. to be at the pool when it opens at 6 a.m. I arrive at an empty pool and break out my yoga mat. It's the best moment of quarantine so far. It's so quiet and peaceful in the cool air. But 20 minutes in, another early riser arrives. He walks super slow laps around the pool and flip-flops, dragging his feet. I nickname him Prison Walker because he walks like an inmate walking in a prison yard. Day nine, Prison Walker is on to me. He's there at 6 a.m. sharp, and so I skip the compromising yoga poses and go straight to walking. After 10 minutes of hearing him walk, I decide he's either, in fact, a former inmate or clinically depressed. The foot dragging grows louder and I envision a scene out of the telltale heart. So in order to curb a mounting rage, I do what I always do to cultivate compassion for a difficult person. I imagine they have a horrific terminal illness. Day 10, I visit the pool at 4.30 p.m. I walk outside and feel like I'm being smothered with a wet towel. I check the weather. It's 95 degrees with a heat index of 102 and 44% humidity. And there are two guys running laps around the pool. I start slowly walking and notice one of the runners has tucked his white gym shorts all the way up around each thigh and into his underpants. Because his shorts are both white and tucked strategically, it looks exactly like an adult diaper. I chuckle to myself as diaper guy runs laps around me. Each lap he manages to catch my eye or smile. And as I leave, he does a 180, runs backward and winks. I feel like I'm in a Depends commercial targeted for the newly middle-aged and incontinent. Day 11. During a dinner of salmon and potatoes, I watch a show about a Mongolian woman who went blind at age six. She now travels all over Mongolia, helping blind children attend the one school in the country for the visually impaired. I've never been to Mongolia, but suddenly I feel like I need to drop everything and join this woman's quest to help blind children have access to an education. She travels 10 hours to meet an adorable 11-year-old boy she helped attend the school. He talks about his hopes and dreams of working with computers, and then he says he doesn't have one. I cry onto my salmon and say out loud to an empty hotel room, I'll buy you a computer. Day 12. Today, I have my fourth COVID test. I've decided that my COVID testing parallels the Dr. Seuss book, green eggs and ham. I was tested in a car, by a pool, in a hotel lobby, and in a tent. Would I like a test in a car? Oh no, that sounds too bizarre. By a pool? Oh no, that sounds cruel. In a hotel? Oh no, what about the other clientele? In a tent? Oh no, even with a vent in the tent, I would still lament the event. Day 13, it's a typical morning. I do yoga and prison walker shuffles by me lap after lap in his flip-flops. 
I think about the irony of trying to follow the ethics of yoga while also wanting to push this dude into the pool and scream, don't you have sneakers? But I refrain. And then something odd happens. I look up to see prison walkers sitting in front of me. There are at least 20 other empty chairs and no one else out there. This can mean only one thing. Prison Walker and I are getting married. Day 14. I hate everyone and everything. I refuse to do yoga. At the pool, I hear a group of British folks saying happy birthday to one of their friends. And I think, birthdays are for losers. Day 15. Diaper guy invited me to a party in his room tonight. I didn't go. Day 16. Freedom. I feel like I had been in prison on a far, far away planet. And exiting that prison and into a new country, job, and life is like barreling through the stratosphere in a homemade spaceship, hoping all the pieces hold together long enough to get you through. And scientists agree, re-entry is tricky business. In fact, the safest way to navigate re-entry is also the most terrifying. The spaceship must fly backwards, turn the shuttle nose down, and then drop through the atmosphere belly down. And that is what life will always ask of us, to trust, hold on tight, and plummet into newness. That was Van Veteran, Miss Ginger Nocera. Uh, I wanna give it up one more time for our performers, Miss Carla Nell. Mr. Jordan Jacobo, Mr. Hunter Gatewood, Ms. Vicky Chavez, and uh, Ginger Nocera, who is actually in Thailand, so she couldn't be in my studio, but get up for her. Uh, thank you. Please, please, please submit. Um, look at our calendar at so, uh, so online. Dot com. Um, see if there's a theme in, in mind that you would like. So anyway, thank you. Have a good show. I feel like I've been edging this whole time. <laughs> 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 <laughs>